Varmt välkomna till dagens Biostock Live från Nyhetsbyrån direkt i Stockholm. Vi har ett tema idag som rör sig om ett stort problem, framförallt, eller framförallt ett stort problem i USA, nämligen opioidberoende. Vi kommer att få träffa tre svenska bolag som gör vad de kan för att bidra till att lösa de här problemen. Och det är Claria, och det är Orexo och det är Camurus. Vi kommer att köra presentationer med bolagen. Sen kommer vi att ha en paneldiskussion. Det kommer att bli en kort paus innan paneldiskussionen. Så då får ni inte försvinna från era tv era datorer och skärmar där ute. Varmt välkommen till alla som sitter här idag. Och även ett varmt välkommen till dagens första presentatör. Som är Scott Boyen från Klaria. Välkommen Scott. Mm. Tack. Som jag förstår det ska hållas på engelska. Okej. Okay. Good. Uh, welcome. Um, for those of you who have not heard of Claria, uh, Claria is a pain company. Uh, and a pain company that is uh, focused on making sure that severe pa patients actually receive a reliable pain relief and a rapid pain relief. Uh, the company itself is based on uh, this. It's extremely small, extremely compact dosage form, and it attaches to the inside of the patient's mouth. It's taken very easily. That's it. No need for swallowing. The drug is absorbed across the oral mucosa. We'll talk about that a little bit and some of the advantages. So let's talk about uh, Claria as a company. Uh, essentially, we need to improve the lives of severe pain patients. And so we're focused on exploiting essentially what's material science to advance the way medicines are actually given. How can I say this? Uh, my background is uh, actually 25 years in uh, pharmaceutical research and development. Um, I actually spent uh, uh, a good number of years at Pfizer and uh, a fairly large number of years at AstraZeneca. <coughs> AstraZeneca is where I actually met uh, Frederick Minette, who invented uh, this way of uh, uh, formulating medicines. And I think it was a combination of the two of us that led to the, the buildup of Claria. Uh, the idea behind Claria actually started while I was still at AstraZeneca. Uh, one of the things that um, you actually don't want to be involved in as a pharmaceutical <coughs> scientist is failure. And you can see actually, here am I, talking about the years and years of pharmaceutical failure and the reasons why. So it isn't that much fun to be the first author on the first chapter of a book about how the pharmaceutical industry is failing and why. But uh, the, the lessons from this chapter in this book, which I doubt will be a, a, a New York Times bestseller, but the lessons are first, make sure you know what you're doing as far as the science goes. But the second is actually keep the dose administration as simple as possible. What we see is a lot of clinical trials failing because the patient-to-patient -patient variation of actual exposure to the medicine is too high. And so you actually don't get the efficacy that you need. The second lesson from this is still around the patient. Medicines don't work if patients don't take them. It shouldn't be in a book. It should be common sense. but. Compliance is a huge issue. And so for Claria, focusing on migraine patients in particular, client compliance is an issue. And so we design that compliance into all of our products. Talk a little bit about how Claria was formed. Uh, we actually started the idea, as I said, back when uh, 2012, when I was still at AstraZeneca. We met Frederick. Uh, looked at the uh, sodium alginates as a polymer, polymer or film-forming polymer. Uh, Frederick had filed the patents around it, so the intellectual property was pretty strong. We took in the first round of funding in, in 2015. 
2016, we ran our first trial, actually nine months out of, after the IPO, which uh, I don't know if it's a record, but it's pretty fast. And uh, 2017, uh, two and a half years after forming the country, a company, uh, two years after forming the company, we have uh, 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 entered our first out licensing agreement from one of our products. The reason I'm standing here in front of you today is that that, that product actually, 514, is uh, from our severe uh, cancer pain portfolio. And it's again against uh, overdosing of cancer medications. I'll explain how, uh, how this works, uh, 514, and uh, a little bit around the uh, license agreement with Purdue. There's not a lot I can say about uh, the, the, the product, and, uh, because those, of course, are, are contained in the, in the uh, license agreement. But uh, I can say that uh, it was a big step for us. And for us, two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old company, to be able to advance clinical trials for our first candidate, 119, to secure all the IP around it, and to be able to uh, outlicense our first product within a couple, three years. It's not bad. So what's so wonderful about this? Well, the first thing is, and it's not on this slide, but this is one of the most sticky things I think I've ever encountered. It looks like a dry piece of paper. But as soon as you put it in your mouth, it sticks wherever you put it. And big companies like Purdue, we within AstraZeneca, we have the capacity to look at all drug delivery technologies. And Purdue chose this one because it's unique, truly unique. It's derived from brown algae off the Norway coast. Uh, the polymer itself is nothing particularly special. It's the IP that we, can, we possess, actually, is around how you treat it and how you make it into this dry film. The alginate itself, uh, the polymer, is approved for both drug and food use worldwide. It, if you ate some artificial yogurt this morning, it's probably in your yogurt. And most importantly, the base technology is pr protected. And in addition, our IP uh, is also protected around each product. So you saw probably on Sunday, if you're, if you're watching us, we uh, uh, released a press release uh, about the base technology patent being st strengthened here in Europe. But also, if you've been watching us, you see us progressing each product through these individual product-specific patents. So our IP position is quite strong. Uh, I showed you the film. Essentially, it goes from this to this. This is the secret sauce. This is what we do. The films we develop are designed for rapid effect. You saw extremely simple administration. And I think one of the most important parts, and we'll come to that a little bit later, particularly in the uh, case of opioid overdose, is it's extremely compact. You can imagine a situation where you need this everywhere. And if you have a nasal spray or an injector kit, they're huge. This is the package with the film in it. This is all there is. In an ambulance situation, in an acute situation at the home, this is what you need. We load the film with the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Sorry for using acronyms here, but API is active pharmaceutical ingredient. The drug is actually absorbed directly across the oral mucosa. You have a lot of mucosal membranes in your body, your nose, your mouth, your intestines. They're roughly all constructed in the same manner. So those things which are dosed intranasally or orally can be absorbed. Many of them can be absorbed across the oral mucosa as well. And we in Sweden, of course, are very familiar with SNUS. Uh, we use it uh, a lot here. Uh, uh, not me, but uh, uh, a lot of people do. So we know that nicotine can be absorbed up here.
Flores Films, actually, if you look at uh, this issue of compliance and, and user friendliness, this is an extremely important part, particularly in our migraine portfolio. And what we're trying to do is remove all of the barriers the patients see in taking a medication. And that includes making sure that you have a rapid onset of action for the medication, but also that you yourself, a person in severe pain, actually are not burdened by your medication and the way you have to give it. Injections are not popular. Nasal sprays, with, uh, particularly with migraine patients, are not particularly popular either. Uh, inhalation is a little bit easier. Uh, and what we're trying to do is rank up here with these as far as a rapid onset of action but to be the easiest administration form and compete with these. Particularly for, for substances like we'll talk about a little later, naloxone against opiate overdose. Essentially, we're, we're competing with nasal sprays and injections. But we also try to profile ourselves as much faster than tablets. And our first uh, migraine project, uh, 119, actually has shown that we do have a, a, a faster and more reliable uptake. Production of the film is also an advantage for us, uh, that our cost of goods are actually quite low. For those of you who know about paper, the paper and plastic industry, this machine actually looks quite familiar. This is a standard coating process, and this is what we use to manufacture the large scale. So the cost of goods, the end cost to the patient, and the margins on our products are actually significantly larger than those, potentially significantly larger, than those who are manufacturing bulky products like nasal sprays, pre-filled syringes, simply because this is so easy. It's such a standard process. The film uh, solution essentially is, is dried. Uh -huh. Dried from a suspension of the polymer. It's coated out here, dried along this line, and rolled up into a roll. That roll is then used to produce the doses. It's no more complicated than that. The other simple thing is our development model. It's using all generic substances within Claria thus far. We do formulation testing, we do some pilot clinical studies to find the right dose, and we run the clinical trials for registration. Most of those clinical trials are what you call bioequivalents, which can take as few as 12 patients. It goes extremely quickly, relatively speaking. Clara's focus areas, as I've mentioned, essentially we started the company to serve severe pain patients, particularly migraine patients who couldn't take a nasal spray or didn't want to take a nasal spray, and those migraine patients who actually were, had concomitant nausea and vomiting. You can imagine a migraine patient taking a tablet and then vomiting. Now they have a migraine and they have anxiety about whether or not the tablet actually was still there. It's an impossible situation, and they don't need that. This market is large, and what we've done is our first product actually has reformulated the most popular drug in this space. I won't talk that much more about it because we're focusing on opiates today. Sumatriptan, it's our most advanced project, and this is the size of the market, about $4 billion per year. Breakthrough Cancer Pain, we have some very promising projects here. Uh, and our first project actually within Breakthrough Cancer Pain has actually grown into opiate overdose, naloxone. So let's talk about this. Uh, market size of about a billion per year. This isn't our estimate. Uh, it isn't our, our collaboration product partner's estimate. This is actually an estimate from the uh, makers of the nasal spray that's uh, leading the market at the moment. One, one billion and, up and, and upwards. 
why do we need this in the first place? Well, here are a few numbers, and you can see them in the papers. Uh, if, you, if you watch this uh, 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 develop, uh, not only in the U.S., but, but even here in Sweden. Um, in the U.S., roughly 55 to 65 plus thousand people per year are dying. That's an Airbus a day. One of the reasons behind, uh, underlying this is this number. I just want you to look at this number for a second. 650,000 prescriptions for opiate-containing medicines very, every day in the U.S. It's hard to believe, but that's what's happening. This is, this is for a reason. There are a lot of pain patients out there, and they are underserved. And one of the ways that physicians uh, solve their problems is actually prescribing quite strong medications to them. So this number is what it is, but it's led to a certain percentage of patients becoming addicted. Effective, extremely effective uh, medicines, but they do carry an addiction risk. One of the issues with this number is the progress of these patients to elicit uh, uh, opiate use. So once your prescription ends, if you're addicted, you basically turn to something else. This is what happened to Prince, Tom Petty. Uh, essentially, these are overdoses, accidental overdoses. This is what the film is designed to address. Make sure that everyone who thinks they need one, and perhaps a lot of people who don't think they need one, have a set of these in their pocket. Naloxone, I just wanted to uh, discuss what it is. Uh, it is one of the only antidotes for opiate overdose. At the moment, it's given as a nasal spray or as an injection. Essentially, the patient wakes up extremely quickly. Uh, opiates, in general, depress your breathing centers. So essentially, you stop breathing. But your heart is still beating. So distribution of the drug uh, still happens. Naloxone essentially kicks the opiate off the proper receptors in the brain that are depressing breathing. The thing is, in order to save lives, naloxone has to get in, and it has to get in quickly. It's one of the reasons why it's given as nasal spray or an injection now. So as I'd mentioned earlier, in the naloxone space with 514, what we're really competing with are injectables, which carry a significant uh, 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 needle stick risk. They also have a bit of a price problem there's a very nice uh, auto injector for naloxone out there. I think the minimum price I've seen for that auto injector is about $2,000 per dose. The average price that I've seen online is actually around $6,000 per dose, five to 6,000. The nasal sprays are a little bit cheaper, but not much. What you find are a lot of government agencies, a lot of local communities actually spending their entire emergency response budgets in the first quarter of the year on naloxone. It's too expensive. But it has to be. These are expensive preparations. Not only are they expensive preparations, but they're also difficult preparations to have on hand. Because the markets demand two things. One is that patients actually who are prescribed an opiate-containing preparation actually should be co-prescribed in naloxone. Why not give the antidote if there's an overdose risk? There's no reason. So part of our market share should be co-prescription, these 650,000 prescriptions that are written every day. The other, which is probably equally as large or larger, is that there should be a set of these in every fire truck, taxi, police car, 
uh, abuse ward, and even in emergency vehicles like tow trucks, and unfortunately in school buses as well. But these are vehicles. And if you look at the previous slide, those are solutions. One of the problems with solutions is that they freeze. This doesn't freeze. It's the same no matter what the temperature is. So the burden on users and the rescuers of overdose patients are actually lower. So I'll just finish off with just mentioning a few things about uh, our uh, license agreement with Purdue, uh, just to make sure that uh, we're as clear as we possibly can. Um, essentially, Claria gives a license for the naloxone film to Purdue Canada, with whom we co-developed the product. Purdue Canada actually has taken a global license so they have the rights to license further to Purdue U.S. and to Mundi Pharma. So that's the way we've written the contract. We wrote it that way so that we would have, Claria would have access to the global market. So every patient who needs it should be able to get it. Where does the money come from? Well, the money comes from all three. Purdue Canada, for the U.S. and Monday. The structure of the agreement is more or less the value statement of Claria as well. So this is a good model for actually how we out would like to out-license our products and how we have thus far done it. Essentially, Purdue is paying Claria to develop, co-develop 514. When the license is activated, when we reach, reach the R&D milestones and the sales start, it's a normal royalty agreement. And the interesting part of this agreement is the supply part. Since this is a new thing, and since it's difficult for big companies actually to start up these kinds of specialty manufacturing capacities, we actually manufacture it. And hopefully, we can uh, make a few margins on, on that supply as well. So we manufacture the film, and we sell that film back to Purdue. And they distribute it. And actually, as I said, this is, this is kind of the value proposition for all of our products in our portfolio. So I just want to summarize. I think we have a very strong patent strategy, and the technology itself lends, it, lends itself very well to uh, specialized IP protection. Um, I'm not going to say it's dead cheap to make, but it's extremely cost efficient to make this. And has clear convenience advantages. All three of our present uh, focus areas within Claria, migraine, cancer pain, and now opiate overdose, very large potential for growth. And these unique products, actually, they make their own, they make their own markets, usually. And finally, as a company, we've demonstrated we can do clinical trials, we can develop medicines, but also that we can out-license them, we can sell them, we can actually make money. So I'll stop there. Thank you for that, Scott. Thank you. I think we should give him a warm applause. So, my mistake earlier was that I did not actually tell you that the presentation was going to be in English. I'm sorry for that. Um, I can say also that the reason that we do a presentation in English is that this will also come from a certain spreading in the USA. One of the presentations will come to us in Swedish, the last one. So. We're ready for the next speaker. Uh, this is uh, Nikolai Sørensen from Orexo, and uh, I think we should give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you.
So maybe you would prefer me speaking English as I'm from Denmark and at least when I'm in Gothenburg, there's one who always complained that I should speak English because it's difficult to understand my Swedish. So, so maybe you will appreciate that as well. So I'm Nikolai Sorensen. I'm the CEO of Orexo. I've been with Orexo since 2011. I became CEO uh, early 2013. Prior to that, I worked with Pfizer where I was responsible for Sweden and I also was responsible for a brand called Lyrica, which where I had people all over Europe reporting into me. So I've basically been responsible for sales in every European countries and Australia and New Zealand. Uh, with Pfizer, uh, with Orexo, uh, I've been part of building up our unit in the US and I'll come to that later, shortly, see if I can move forward here. So we have a subsidiary sitting in Morristown, New Jersey uh, that we established in the summer of 2013. Uh, in Morristown, New Jersey, we have all of our commercial operations, but we also moved our clinical development to Morristown, New Jersey, because that's where we see our key market for Rexo is in the US. So it's easier to do clinical studies and understand what is needed in the home market of, of the US. Uh, I would say I personally have been a lot to the US when we launched. I was in the US every month. Um, and one of the experiences, given that we today are talking about opioid addiction, that I think is a little unique, is I've actually been out visiting, I'm counting more than 100 different clinics in the US, all over the US, from Florida to Chicago to Boston to Pittsburgh, you name it. And I've been out there seeing these doctors. I met patients all over the US. So I think I have a pretty rich experience. And at the same time, daily, every day, we have more than 60 people in the US out visiting clinics and if they do what they should they're visiting eight different clinics every day to get feedback also what is needed in the market and how's the market dynamic. So where are we with Orexo? I think one thing that put us a little apart from a lot of other Swedish companies is that we actually today come from a very strong financial position. In 2017 we had our second year of positive uh, positive profit. Uh, we also have for the last two years generated more than 300 million kroner in positive cash flow from operations. And today we are ca net cash positive. So even though we have a corporate bond, we actually didn't do that because we needed it. We did it because we could and we can use that to develop the company further. Another part that I worked a lot with for the last couple of years is improving the efficiency in the company. And just like the previous speaker, it's very important to bring down the cost of goods. And that's something we have worked intensively on the next, uh, for the last couple of years. Because looking into the addiction market, one of the big challenges is to make the treatment affordable. Both the naloxone treatment, as we just heard from Claria, but also when you get to the treatment of patients. If you're just looking at, at <coughs> today's budget of about two and a half billion dollars in pure medicines cost. If we want more patients to get access, we can't afford to increase the prices substantially. And that's why we see we have a unique opportunity because today I'm pretty sure that we are the cheapest product to, to produce in the US. And we know today we compete in prices which are below some of the generic prices in the market. And that results in us, and that's something that's focus we had last year, is to make in agreements with insurance companies. And today we have the best market access we've ever had since launch. And if we look at the privately insured segment, we actually have better access than any other product in the market, including the market leader Suboxone Film, but also the generics. We did get approval in Europe in November last year. So now we are planning for, for launching in Europe, actually with the same partner as Claria. So it's with Mundi Pharma, who's going to launch our product. We expect to see the first country coming out uh, in uh, early Q2. And then maybe the overhang for those of you who have followed us for a while is that we've had a patent litigation hanging over us. We had a hearing in, a, in a, the federal court uh, in October. We, we felt that it went very well. So did our lawyers. Uh, and right now time is actually playing in our favor because if it was a decision purely against us, we would have known that already. That doesn't mean that the decision necessarily become purely for us, but it's not a firm decision say we approve the decision from the district court. There will be some kind of change because of the time that has spent. So where are we right now? The focus for the company is definitely to leverage the position we have in market access. And I will come a little back to that later. It's also to launch ships outside the US. We have the rights to, we are supplying Mundi Pharma. We have the first supply now in Q4, but we are going to produce and sell subsolves to them. So we actually have income streams, both from royalties, but also from selling products to Mundi Pharma. 
Then with the money that we have on, on our cash account right now, and as, remember, we have POS2 net cash, we have a POS2 cash flow. We had nearly 150 million in POS2 cash flow last year. So we're basically building financial capacity. We have a pipeline with some products that we have communicated and a few other products that are still uh, to be disclosed because we're waiting for the proof of concept data. Uh, so I hope we can add on to the pipeline during this year. But also on business development, I've been to talks with several companies, but it is a challenge as a small Swedish company to come out and discuss business development if you haven't secured your financial position. And where we are right now is that we have a decent amount of cash and we have a positive result backing it up to drive growth coming forward. So where is the focus for us, both in business development and R&D? It is on a range we've decided to focus our efforts on addiction because of the experience we get from meeting physicians. And we're talking hundreds of physicians every single day. We get a lot of feedback into what is needed in the market, what drives the market. And here we see we can improve treatment, Subsol is one area, but also our new product, Awake 3A2, which is a swallowable tablet, is an, a, an example of an area where we're working on treatment of addiction. Then there are symptoms and comorbidities of addiction. People who are addicted to opioids are the most complex people that you can imagine. Often they suffer from pain, they suffer from a range of psychiatric disorders. And here we see an opportunity for us to broaden our pipeline either as a co-promotion or develop or in license our own products in that area. And finally, just as we heard, there's, there's, kind of a, there's a pre prevention of addiction. How can we remove the people to, to get into an addicted situation and, and maybe get to overdose? One thing could be co-prescription of naloxone with painkillers so people don't overprescribe or overuse their, their painkillers. But I also think there are a lot of other technologies that we as a pharmaceutical company uh, industry have missed. We, we have not taken the responsibility to develop new formulations of pain medications that could replace the opioids that we're using today. Looking at where we are, we have development projects and ideas in all of these categories. And we also have business development discussions ongoing with different companies in all of these categories at the moment. So where are we with the company? Our lead product is Subsolve for opioid dependence. It's about 80% of our revenues. But we also have license income from Avstral, which is a, uh, it's a cancer pain product. We have license income from Edloir, Insomnia. We're about to launch Subsolve in Europe. We have a phase two ready or phase, past phase two with OX51, which is a very uh, potent opioid. I can, in favor of time, I, I probably need to come back to that with a different time. And then we have our products that we're in, bot in the bottom line, and that's really where we focus. We have OX382 for opioid dependence and potentially pain. We also have several undisclosed projects, and the reason why we don't disclose them is we want to be sure that we have enough data to that we can file for a patent, so our competitors don't get the ideas from us and start to work on the same before we have filed patents. So we will disclose them as we get enough data to file for a patent. And just looking at OIC 3A2, which is our, we aim to be the first swallowable tablet. And what really differentiates OIC 3A2 in this market is it's a tablet that you basically take with a glass of water and then you swallow it. Whereas the current formulation of Suboxone and Subsolve, they are all based on sublingual technologies, meaning that you take it under the tongue and then you wait it for it to dissolve. If you look across all different disease areas, at least I am unaware of any area where a sublingual tablet is favored ahead of a, a swallowable tablet if you don't have a clear medical benefit uh, to the patients. And here we actually have a maintenance treatment, so it's not supposed to be fast acting. Uh, it's more that today it's more effective to give it sublingually than should you swallow the tablet. We have the first patients actually in. I heard yesterday they had the second dosing, all of the patients. Uh, so we expect to get some results in, um, in Q2. And that will give us some proof of, of uh, concept that it actually works. Um, and then we have Subsolve, our lead product. And, and I'll be very brief on, on where we are with Subsolve. Subsolve is a buprenorphine naloxone product. Buprenorphine is in there as an opioid replacement therapy, it's basically taking away the cravings. It's a, you can say, a nicer opioid than the ones that people normally take. If you take heroin, one doctor explained it to me, it's like you're coming in and someone just uh, into a dark room and someone light up a Christmas tree and it's just like the most sparkling light that you can imagine. If you take buprenorphine, it's like someone is just slowly fading up the light. 
to never get sparkling and then it's just slowly fading up, fading down. But with heroin, it's like someone turning off the switch overnight and that is what is give, immediately and that's what gives you the cravings. So this is basically enabling people to have a normal life. It is the main competitors in the market today is Suboxone and it's a special Suboxone film which is marketed by a company called Indivia. And why should you then believe that Subsolve had have a chance? When we entered the market, we had a lot of clinical data. Um, I think actually still to date, we have the broadest clinical program of any company in the industry. And we saw when patients took our product, they actually favored our product. So in a, in, in a direct preference test to Suboxone film and even Suboxone tablet, they actually preferred, and we're talking 70 to 80% of patients preferred our formulation compared to the other competitors. And then we have worked intensively to create a broad dosage range. So what does that mean? We see that in this area there's a significant need for patients to, to dose to effect. Some days they need more, some days they need less. So here with a broader dosage range they can better adapt their treatment to the needs. But most importantly, I think just listening, and this is coming back from the physicians that we're talking to, one of the issues you have today in the market is that Patients are basically often titrated up to the dose where they get effect, but there's no one taking a responsibility for, tight to, for tapering them down to the minimum or even to abstinence. And what we heard from the market is that this 1.4 milligram or what is, is equivalent from other companies is too high. You need something lower to be able to taper patients down. And that's what we have developed this 0.7 milligram. So today we actually have an opportunity to take for patients to take very small steps upwards and very small steps downwards to hopefully one day get them down to abstinence or a very low dose of, of uh, subsolve uh, and get them maintained on that. So looking at Europe where we're about to launch, the European market is much smaller than the US. We have a different data indicating about 1.3 million patients in Europe who are high risk users. A lot of them are coming from, open, from heroin, whereas in the US it's really painkillers. In the US, there's all kind of numbers floating around, but I think the consensus right now is that we're talking somewhere between 10 to 20 million Americans who are suffering from some kind of add addiction or dependence on opioids, 10 to 20 million Americans. So the European market is much smaller. It's much more controlled here in, in Europe. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of countries like Sweden have pretty good social security systems. So we know who the addicted patients are. But in the US, there's this big hidden group of people who are taking painkillers that are not really identified by the systems. And, and also, there are no central systems to monitor the patients. So Europe is, is interesting, but, but the US is much bigger. And lo looking at the market in the US, we have a situation where right now, if you listen to the White House, they're citing about 64,000 people died from addiction or drug overuse in 2016. That does include other products than, than opioids, but opioids were nearly always involved in some shape and form. So this is an immense problem. And just looking at how many people who are using opioids in the US, the issue is not can we grow 6 to 7% per year? I think the issue we have is that 90% of the patients are without any kind of treatment today. And how can we broaden that treatment? And how can we broaden it in a way that is affordable for the system and not breaking the system, just like we heard now that the entire rescue medication budget was going on to naloxone. I think we as a pharma industry has a responsibility to bring affordable products to the market also. And just listening to the White House, and, and we actually have a pretty good relationship even with Chris Christie, who's leading the Opioid Commission, or led the Opioid Commission. There's no doubt that they understand the problem. The issue we have right now is that there's a lot of talk, but there's no money. And I think there's a need for this one to really fly. There's a need for money to come in. Uh, but there's no doubt we get the attention from the politicians in, in the US as needed. So just taking the experience that I have from, from this more than 100 visits to different clinics in the US and talking to multiple key opinion leaders. I think the biggest issue in the US is access to treatment. It's access to medical assisted treatment where a lot of patients are, are doing purely abstinent treatment without use of any kind of medical assisted. And for, to get more patients into medical assisted treatment, we also need to ensure that we have an affordable treatment for, for the patient. So, Access, get more patients into treatment, I think is the absolute key from getting from 10% treatment up to the numbers we see for other chronic diseases, which are often in the 70 to 80% of people with the, with the disease, 
get access to some kind of treatment. And we're into the recognition of value of MAT. MAT is medical assisted treatment, which buprenorphine and methadone are the two biggest ones. What I see in the US is that a lot of people, and I can recognize that as being a father to teenage daughters. If one of my daughters got addicted, I would say, just get rid of the stuff. I, I don't get them abstinent. But this is actually one of the biggest causes of death in the US, is people are getting their kids abstinent, putting them into very expensive resorts, often down in Florida. They come back and have to face reality of life. And what happens when you face reality of life? You actually start to get at your cravings is starting to come back. And what's your solution when you feel cravings is to take opioids. You take it, and then often people take the same as they did just before they went into their treatment, resulting in an overdose. And here we need all of the larger centers to recognize the value of, of medical assisted treatment. And then we also need the entire system in the US to recognize the need to find programs to get people down to the lowest possible dose over time. But you can't just stop at a heartbreak. There's no data to support that approach. We need to develop new treatments. Uh, I think today the big pharma companies have completely ignored this space. But going back to the 80s and 90s, where both depression came first and in, the, in the 90s or so, depression became very big. The biggest sold product was so-called from Pfizer, uh, where, where sold off from Pfizer, where, where this suddenly got a lot of attention from the big pharma companies. We've seen the same with obesity, which have been very stigmatized. And, and now we see all of the big pharma companies starting to invest. Hopefully, Orexo with our positive cash, when we see ideas, can be part of financing and be part of developing new treatments, which are not based on opioid replacement therapies. Then you need to control prescription of opioids and, of course, also the non-prescription opioids, the criminal products. And here we see there is a lot of efforts going on in the US. But the problem you have is when you're taking people away from their painkillers, they're still addicted. It, just, it doesn't remove because you just can't get access to your OxyContin you're still addicted. So when you're taking away the painkiller, what do you do? You go down on the street and you try to start to buy, maybe first you buy the, the painkillers that you just took on the street, but they are very expensive. One tablet of OxyContin is often 80 to $100. You got it for free when you got it prescribed. One dose of heroin is $10 maybe. So what happens, people start to take heroin, and then you actually go from the ashes to the fire. In Philadelphia, they did a lot of efforts to bring down the use of, of painkillers to adult sense. So, so people in, in, from somewhere around 18 to 22 years of age. What happens, they quadrupled in the number of deaths on overdose because people basically went to the street and used heroin. So it's, it's not an easy solution right now just to stop prescribing opioids, as some people suggest. And in the end, we need to destigmatize. We need to get people to be open about the problem and to seek help. We need physicians to be open about the issue and helping to treat patients. Uh, and here there's still a lot of work to do, but I can say it's a very different environment than it was two years ago in the US. Then a little about Subsol and the market. We've seen the market growing with uh, more than 10% if we look quarter over quarter. Uh, in, in the fourth quarter, 11.3% compared to the same quarter the year before. The interesting part is that it's really growing is the public market and, and just bringing down, no, actually went back a little too fast. In the public market, what you've seen is, is Obamacare that is coming in. People get access to insurance. And also there was an, a change in legislation in 2016, which allowed more physicians to prescribe. But to be able to prescribe to more patients, you had to take insurance, and that is actually driving on the need for Medicaid. Medicaid has a completely different payment willingness to pay than the commercial insurance companies. So here again, price become extremely important to make it affordable for the Medicaid. Otherwise, they won't use it. So just looking at Subsol. So Subsol have gone a little like a staircase, a little up and down. I can tell every time we go up, and every time we go down, it is explained by market access in agreements with insurance companies. If you don't get agreements with insurance companies, you have a major issue. Uh, and this is where we come back again to make it affordable and be cost competitive. And just looking at where we are right now, we actually had the second week of this year was the third highest ever. It was actually the highest ever in terms of milligram prescribed subsol. Then you always have the kind of little ketchup effect after the Christmas season. So it's normally a high week. The last two years we were cheated for that of different reasons, but this year we saw a big bump and then you see a little fall down after that. So, but looking ahead for this year, we have, we're moving the share of the market that we have exclusive. When we got United as exclusive, WellCare is exclusive. We have about 3% of the total market in the US have exclusively 
reimbursement of subsolve, and we're doubling that this year. So during this year, we're going up to 6%. We are going up to 96% of the people with private insurance have access to subsolve, and we're going up to more than 40%, it's actually 43% of the people with a public insurance have access to subsolve unrestricted. And that is really the key in the US. If you don't get things reimbursed, you have no sales. Uh, so that's our big focus have been historically and commercially. This is really where we play now. This is more like a tender business, getting tenders with the insurance companies, work with the insurance companies to find an affordable price that is uh, make it valuable for them. And I think this year we have done it uh, tremendously well. So we definitely have a good foundation to grow in 2018. And this is really where our focus is. How can we leverage the 96% unrestricted access? A lot of that is, is pretty low rebate. So if we get to the growth also, we actually have some pretty profitable growth ahead of us. Then the biggest one of these is a company called CVS Caremark. And with CVS Caremark, um, that, that is a, going to be a street fight because we don't get anyone. We're not replacing something. We just get access to compete with the other companies. Uh, but I do think there is a, a good opportunity for us to grow in here. And then we have two exclusive agreements, Envision and Humana. And they're right now about to implement. We've seen Humana has implemented part of it, but not all of it. Envision is still in, in the early stage of implementing our agreement. Uh, so we expect to see really the impact coming late in this quarter and into next quarter. Then we have Medicare, which is for people who are retired. We have our first exclusive agreement. That actually kicks in here by 1st of January. But we have learned in the US is that patients have one month of grace period, so they can stay on their existing treatment for one month before they have to change. So we expect first to see the effect of this coming into February. And then what we're doing now when we have increased access, we're investing into market improved and expanded field force in areas where we see that, uh, that, that we could have a good return of investment of that. And this is my uh, second last picture, I think. So our net revenue last year was 644 million. We had a positive EBITDA of 78 million, positive cash flow 147. We have positive net cash position with 328 million in the, in the bank. But what I think is worth not noticing here is that we actually have, during the last two years, we've generated more than 300 million kroner in free cash flow, which has really strengthened that financial base for us and also to expand and to grow the company. So just looking ahead, we have a very strong financial pat platform. We have positive EBIT, we have guidance that we expect to be positive also in 18. We have a pipeline of interesting projects uh, that we see we can now with the money we have, can, we can accelerate and expand further. We have market access that we can leverage. We think to, we start to see some signs right now, but, but I think that the big effect is coming a little later in the quarter. We have Subsol launch in Europe coming in in second quarter. We have uh, business development efforts where my aim is to add another product, but I'm not doing that if I can't find a product that is profitable for our shareholders. Uh, and finally, we have maybe the biggest overhang of them all, the patent litigation. And, and I feel that we have ground for optimism based on what we saw in the hearing we had with the federal court in October, and also based on the time now that have gone since that hearing, which is indicating there's going to be a change of the decision. Uh, from the district court. And with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you for your attention. So. Tackar vi Nikolaj för en intressant presentation. Det är dags för nästa bolag att presentera sig. Ja, nu sa ju jag att den presentationen skulle hållas på svenska. Det var faktiskt fel av mig. Vi kommer att hålla på engelska den också. Fredrik Tive från Camurus, välkommen. Hello. Hello and thank you. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm here today. Fredrik Tiberg, I'm the CEO of Camurus since 2003 and have been part of the development of this company. And uh, we are at the very interesting stage of our development. We have uh, what we believe is a game-changing product for treatment of opioid dependence, CAM 2033, 2038, um, in registration phase in the US, Europe, and Australia. And I will uh, try to give you a presentation of this product as well as our general development within the company. 
So, but before going into details about CAMP 2038, I want to talk a little bit about the company and our pillars of success, as you see here. Uh, we have a very strong uh, platform technology, which we call Fluid Crystal. It has been validated now in more than 20 clinical trials and proven to be safe and tolerable and provide interesting uh, and functional effects in treatment of a number of different diseases. Based on this fluid crystal technology, we have developed a broad, late-stage R&D pipeline. Currently, we have more than 10 clinical programs in development, covering areas such as addiction, pain, cancer, obesity, endocrine, and cardiovascular disease. So a very broad pipeline. And we are also looking at a potential approval now in the opioid dependence space during 2018, as I said. In advance of that approval, we are also building a commercial organization in Europe. Um, and we, at this point, have all the leadership in place. Uh, Richard Jameson, who is here together with me, our chief commercial officer, has developed a very strong team for Europe. And uh, we are now fully operational for a potential 2018 launch of CAMP 2038. In addition to be able to um, develop all the opportunities we have in the company, we also have a number of strong partnerships. This includes Novartis Pharmaceuticals, Brayburn Pharmaceuticals, and Rhythm, which we all have clinical programs together with, as well as, um, and they provide not only R&D investments and uh, potential for milestones and royalties, but also contribute to building of our ov overall value uh, offering. We have an experienced management play team in place and very strong, dedicated teams from development up to commercialization. Looking uh, at the company from a stock market perspective, we currently have a market cap of about 4 uh, billion Swedish crowns. We had a short uh, uh, setback in terms of our uh, U.S. registration, which we are now uh, working on uh, and resubmitting as quickly as possible together with our partner, Brayburn Pharmaceuticals. Our cash position is strong with 370 million, and we have an OPEX of about 25 million crowns per month, 2017. Our employees are currently 70 in the company and we are headquartered in Lund, Sweden. So what are we working with? Our main focus is long-acting medications. Uh, long-acting medications address a lot of key healthcare issues. For opioid dependence, as well as many other diseases, uh, one of the key challenges is compliance, that is, remembering to take your medication daily or several times per day. This is completely avoided by long-acting medications where you can give a, a small in dose injection and have a treatment effect over an entire month or a week, depending on your target. They also address potential for better treatment outcomes, which is important, and not the least patient convenience. It is, of course, much more convenient to have administration of a drug product every month than having to remember it every day. And just to illustrate the importance of this area, uh, I can say that if you're looking at the depot products, long-acting medications today, it's more than 50 billion Swedish crowns in overall sales at this moment. So it's a very substantial market where a lot of the sales are in the CNS area, obviously, where, where there are medi medical needs, but also in other indications such as endocrine disease, metabolic disease and so forth. So what is our solution to this? Uh, we have developed a very interesting system. It's, it's actually a simple liquid, but it's a very smart liquid because when it comes in contact with body tissue, it transforms itself into an encapsulating gel immediately on injection. Through that encapsulation, the drug active compound is then trapped and does not get released until the body is degrading the um, matrix and then the active component is then slowly released over time. And by controlling the composition of this lipid liquid, 
we can actually control the rate so it goes from weekly duration to monthly duration for instance. Due to the fact that it's a simple liquid it's easy to administer, it has a rapid onset but still long acting release giving us special uh, advantages in many indications where you want to have rapid onset but still have a long acting effect. It's also applicable across substance classes so we can work with small proteins, peptides as well as small molecule drugs. It has so far shown a very good safety profile and we can use standard manufacturing processes which enables us to more effectively develop drug products. Just looking at what this achieves in terms of release of an active compound, if you take an ordinary peptide, this is um, sandostatin um, IR here and you can see the pharmaceutical levels or, or the drug levels in the blood they go up very quickly but then just die out. So if you want to have a treatment effect of this compound in this uh, situation you would need to take repeated injections several times per day. If you take the same peptide and you put it in our fluid crystal system you can see what happens. You have a slow release in this case we're showing for 30 days very continuous like an infusion. It's a completely different shape and here you could have treatment effect for one month instead. So going from repeated injections to one injection per month, this is a clear value proposition for most patients. So what is our business model? Uh, to enable effective development of, of our drug products and drug product candidates, we combine clinically documented compounds, so compounds that we know are efficacious in the particular indication of interest or are safe in that indication, together with a validated proprietary technology. And this technology is now on the verge of being introduced in, a, in, in, in the first product and we think that we have a strong value enhancement. Looking in this space it is more than yeah, I would say 20 years ago since there came something really new and innovative in the long-acting depot technology space. So, what have we done with this technology? We have created a very diversified late-stage R&D pipeline. Our lead program is of course CAM 2038. Here we have developed both a weekly injection because that's important in some indications in some patient groups especially at the early stage of treatment and a monthly. <coughs> we have taken them to registration phase in the US, Europe and Australia, the most important markets currently for opioid dependence treatment, addressing huge unmet needs but also providing us with potential short-term revenues. So our US partner Brave Arm Pharmaceuticals for instance in conjunction with approval will have a 32 35 million dollar um, approval milestone coming from this project, enabling us to also work with our other developments. We are also working in the chronic pain area, very interesting project, high unmet need, long acting medications can provide continuous round the clock pain relief and here we are in the middle of phase three, we will deliver results during uh, Q2 this year for this project and we have very good hopes here. Together with Novartis we have finished phase two development of two uh, of our CAM 2029 product which is a long-acting octreotide for neuroendocrine tumors and acromegaly and Novartis are continuing their preparations for start of phase three having FDA meetings in this time period to finalize the study designs and other preparations. We have a number of other programs, here we are in the discussions about out licensing in the chemotherapeutic uh, induced nausea and vomiting space. We're planning the continuation of our post-operative uh, pain studies and we are also having some very interesting orphan indications together with Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, a company from Boston, we're developing a long-acting product for treatment of rare genetic disease and in addition to that we just recently started 
a very exciting project directed at pulmonary arterial hypertension, also an orphan indication, with a mean survival of about 2.7 to 3 years untreated, where we have created a long-acting formulation of trepostinil, a currently used and approved drug compound. In addition, we have a medical uh, device on the market for treatment of cancer side effects. Oh, the topic of this discussion is, of course, uh, opioid dependence, and we believe weekly and monthly buprenorphine depots, which we are developing, is not only a potential, but will be a game changer in the treatment of opioid dependence. This is, as you have heard from the previous speakers, an enormous problem. It's, it's uh, very much, you know, over and above what anybody could expect. We are now seeing the death figures in the U.S. rising very rapidly, with 44,000 people dying in 2016 of opioid overdoses and even more of other drugs of abuse. Unfortunately, this trend is not only occurring in the U.S. If you're looking at the Swedish figures from the Tox Institute, you can see that um, we are seeing a very similar development in overdoses. And a lot of this is due to the fact that fentanyl and very potent opioids are coming out on the streets, and uh, you need very small quantities to get respiratory depression. So this is real. And it's a very big global problem. You're seeing it in Australia, you're seeing it in Sweden and other European countries. Opioids are the largest society burden of all drugs. It's a public health epidemic in the US, and patients really need better access to care and new treatment choices. This is fundamental to be able to tackle this global problem. And we know also that investment in treatment brings significant value. I mean, calculations, healthcare economical calculations say that investment of one dollar into treatment creates between 12 and uh, between two and 12 dollars in return for society. So this is a <coughs> very good investment. <clears throat> we know. And we have heard about this earlier from Nikolai, that current medication assistant treatment is effective. It reduces illicit opioid use, it decreases mortality, it limits the spread of bloodborne disease, it improves quality of life of patients. It's a huge difference to be on the street being dependent on heroin or being in treatment. It completely transforms, transforms the lives of patients. It improves public health, so social functioning, reduces crime, and these are huge costs for society. However, current uh, MAT treatment has also significant limitations. First of all, it's very difficult for these patients to go daily and take their tablets, remember them, have they given them away to friends and sold them to somebody. As soon as you come into withdrawal, the first thing, the natural thing a patient does is trying to find a new fix, a new heroin dose or a new anything to take away these problems. It is also burdensome and stigmatizing. In Sweden, for instance, you have to go to the clinic either daily or several times per week and show that you are clean before you can receive treatment. With an injection that comes weekly or monthly, you avoid all that stigma. And you don't have to meet your dealer outside the door where you have been and getting your recipe. It also has potential for changing a lot of the problems associated with medication-assisted treatment, because methadone, as well as buprenorphine, are spread and misused and sold illegally on the streets for the wrong reasons. So, uh, for this reason, we can also reduce uh, a lot of the issues in, in society around current treatment. And also, there are stringent patient uh, treatment rules. Patients drop out of treatment because they have to go. Imagine if you have to go to vacation, you have to be in your clinic every day or three times per week. It's not easy to combine that with a, an active life and a quality life. And also, there is a lot of regulations. And these people are also impaired in the decision-making, making this even more important. Looking at CAM 2038, it's a unique treatment. 
small volume injection with either a weekly or monthly duration. It's an individualized treatment. So you, depending on your treatment schedule, if you have the weekly visits, you can take the weekly dosing. If you have monthly visits, you can take the monthly dosing. And it's adopted to best clinical practice guidelines. As I said, it's a small dose volume injection. The injection volume is between 0.15, so very small, to 0.65 milliliter injected under your skin. It's like a small bead under your skin which disappears over time. This enhances adherence to treatment, but also provides rapid onset and continuous treatment effect. It safeguards also against diversion and misuse and potential misuse by, by your own children, for instance, in the home who could get hold of your tablets or, or other medications that are around. And we also have very strong efficacy data showing that this treatment works and that it provides improved treatment outcomes. So we have done a very extensive clinical program, including head-to-head -head phase three studies against standard of care sublingual buprenorphine. We showed on the primary endpoint that we met both the FDA and EMA endpoints with good margin. We also, in the secondary endpoint, demonstrated that we had superior treatment effect to current treatment. And you can see that in this image here, showing the levels of abstinence after treatment with CAM 2038 compared to the current sublingual arm. So in addition to everything else, we also have evidence for improved treatment outcome, less misuse of other drugs in this patient group. We have continuous suppression of withdrawal and cravings. Opioid blockade have been shown from first dose. That means that if you take heroin, you will not get the euphoria that you usually do. So in that way, negatively reinforcing continued misuse. We have a safety profile which is comparable to sublingual buprenorphine. Even more important may be patients like this treatment. And that is, of course, fundamental. Of uh, the patients in our long-term safety study, those that were transferred from current treatment with sublingual buprenorphine to CAMP 2038, in the questionnaire, they 68% of the patients said that this is a much better treatment than sublingual buprenorphine. 83% were positive, and only 3% thought it was a much worse treatment. I think this is a very strong outcome. But even more strong, I think, is some of the statements we heard from patients, and these are continuously heard from patients. Uh, these were some of the statements from our ADCOM with the FDA, where we had patient testimonials at the meeting, patients, very moving test, patient testimonials, and I, I can recommend you to listen to those if you want to get more insight. But this is one. The biggest thing with the CAM injection is how simple life became and how the obsession to use was gone. Uh, for the first time in years, I was not reminded of every day of shame and failure one feels as an opioid addict. The Suboxone tablets were a daily reminder that I hated myself and what I had become. The injection removed that ob obstacle and slowly my self-confidence returned. There were many more statements. And, and the interesting thing is that we hear this from Australia, from Sweden, and from the US, where we have done studies. Practitioner has also similar statements about the product. Looking now at the registration and continued work, we had a very intensive 2017, reported positive safety data in May, submitted NDA submissions, approval submissions to uh, FDA and EMA in July, and we were granted priority review by the FDA uh, in September. We had a positive recommendation for approval by the FDA Advisory Committee in November 2017. And then, somewhat surprisingly, I must say, we received a, a CRL, which is a response letter, where the agency demanded further information from us. We have said that we believe that we have all the necessary information and will return with an updated application as soon as possible. Looking at the European and Australian submissions, they are going according to plan, 
and we are believing that we will have a positive CHMP decision in Q3 and a potential approval then in both markets in the end of the year. FDA timeline needs to be confirmed with the FDA and we will do that very shortly and then we will report on it. But uh, we have an estimated timeline in the direction that we are showing on this plan. Most importantly, we have a very strong comprehensive clinical program. We have had no questions about the efficacy and safety data and we believe that we have a, we have a very strong offering both to the market and to the regulatory authorities. We have a global commercialization plan. Our partner Braeburn Pharmaceuticals is responsible for the US market and the rest of the markets we have ourselves retained. Our initial focus is Europe, Australia, but we're also having several discussions about other global markets with partners or in own framework. The competition today, we have Indivior, which recently got an approval for Sublocade monthly. We believe we have a very strong product and uh, that which is very competitive in this setting. But also we are very happy to have Indivior on the market because this is a transformation of the treatment system and two voices are much stronger than one. And I believe there's a strong synergy working together to convert the market into a new and what we think a better treatment form. Um, then there are some early um, developments but at this point they are far away from the market and, and, and potential competition. Looking at the market, if you're looking at the US, this is the prescriptions for um, maintenance treatment in the US. You can see that in 2017, the first, uh, the last part of 2016 and 2017, there was 13 million prescription for um, mainly monthly treatment with buprenorphine. If you convert this or the patient numbers with a 25% uh, long-acting injectable share of the market. You can see and the pricing that is now set by Indivior of 1500 approximately per month, that corresponds to a market potential of three to four billion US dollars. So it's a very significant market potential here in the US. Of course, dependent on penetration. We have a large interest in Europe as well. These are looking at how many prescribers are, would be interested in prescribing uh, a long-acting injectable with a profile of CAM 2038. And you can see that overall it's in the high 80s up to 90s. So there is an understanding by, among the clinicians that this is an attractive treatment. We have large patient numbers and converting this into a market potential, our estimates based on the information available is around 180 to 250 million euros. Again, a very substantial market in, the, in Europe and Australia. We are well on our way to develop our commercial organization. We have the EU leadership team in place. Uh, we have full working process going on with market access and medical affairs, and also established regional leadership functions in Central Europe Northern Europe and Southern Europe at this moment. A lot of activities going on in 2018 uh, in advance of a potential launch. As I said, we have many other things going for us uh, and I will try to be quick here, but chronic pain is definitely a very interesting area for CAM 2038. And there we're expecting top line phase three data sh shortly. In addition, of course, we have other interesting opportunities. Novartis is moving forward with the acromegaly and neuroendocrine tumors, and we are hoping to see developments in phase three as soon as possible. We will be able to communicate the timelines for this better in, during the summer. Um, we have several combined out licensing and development opportunities. And as I said, most recently, we are, have moved forward and, and Rhythm has uh, produced very interesting results from our first study on the genetic obesity and are also moving forward with that program. Very inter interesting indication, large market potential, huge unmet need. 
And also, again, as I said, we have our pulmonary hypertension program where we started a phase one study before Christmas. It's a dose escalating study. And so far we are continuing, which is very good news. And we are hoping to deliver interesting uh, results towards the summer this year. And then, of course, a number of other earlier phase programs. So looking at Camerus and where we are currently, we have a de-risk late stage differentiated pipeline, multi-billion dollar specialty markets across a number of interesting indications, strong collaborations with dedicated partners, of course, Novartis, Brayburn are ones, but we also have others, Rhythm, Solacea and earlier phase programs. Emerging a commercial organization with a strong le leadership on board and mul multiple potential levers for future value creation. This incl includes approvals of CAMP 2038 in the US, EU and Australia, phase three programs in Payne, Acromegaly and NET, and advancement of early phase programs. We have our anticipated CAMP 2038 launches and, as I said, a solid financial position with no debt. That is the finish line of this presentation. Thank you. Interesting presentation. Nu ska vi ta en kort paus. Sen kommer vi att samla ihop alla tre bolagen här på scenen igen och så kommer vi att köra en gemensam liten paneldiskussion och en frågestund där vi kommer att ställa frågor och det kan även hända att ni kan få ställa några frågor om ni har det till bolag. Så om ni vill så får ni gärna ta en kort bensträckare. Vi siktar på att vara tillbaka här igen om fem minuter. Då är vi tillbaka efter en kort paus. Vi har fått lyssna på tre väldigt intressanta företagspresentationer från Claria och från Orexo och Camurus. Nu står jag här med vd för respektive bolag och vi kommer att ha en kort paneldiskussion. Även en frågestund. Och ja, vi kör igång helt enkelt. 150 cirka dödsfall dagligen och fler dödsfall till följd av överdoser av opioidberoende än dödsfall i trafiken. USAs administration gick ut i augusti och deklarerade national emergency. Min första fråga är hur kunde det bli så här egentligen? Vad är bakgrunden till den här skenande utvecklingen? Ordet är fritt. Ja, ja men det finns ju... Man kan ju bara läsa den här Dreamland-boken utav. Jag kan rekommendera alla att läsa den så, så får man en större förståelse för. Men det är ju en kombination av att uh, opioidbehandlingen har liksom skenat i form av smärtindikationer för vad, vad som helst från en ond tå till. Uh, och, och det är klart att resultatet av det är väldigt negativt. Sen finns det många andra samhällstrender som har bidragit till det här och naturligtvis... De kriminella nätverken som faktiskt sprider heroin över USA. Och så att det är många aspekter som har bidragit till det här. Mm. Jag tror amerikanerna har generellt haft ett motstånd mot NSAID-produkter. Så det som vi kallar i trener Alvedon. Så man använder inte så mycket NSAID i USA för man är rädd för biverkningarna med maks och annat. Hjärtkärl biverkningar också. Så, så man har... Och när det är långtidsverkande opiater kom från inte minst Purdue med deras oxycontin på slutet av 90-talet så var det även FDA så hade de räknat med 0,2 procent chans för att du skulle få det beroende. Mm. Idag så är vi, siffrorna kan för nästan 10-20 procent. Mm. Om inte alla går in i någon form av beroende så är det ju en del som är lätt att bli av med det. Men man underskattar det här. Sen tror jag hela det amerikanska systemet. Alltså det är något som jag har lärt mig. Jag kommer från ett europeisk kontext där jag jobbade i Europa. Det är min första erfarenhet för att du sa det. Det är pengar som styr. Mm. Om du börjar titta på det, läkarna de kan få betalt för att skriva ut produkter. Så läkarna tjänar fler pengar. Det är de som börjar skriva ut mycket pengar i USA. Det är läkare som kan få ha det svårt att få en legitim praxis. För det kan finnas speciellt bra läkare, men plötsligt så står folk på kö. Och de får betalt varje gång de skriver ut recept. Patienterna de kan gå och sälja recept. Läkarna kan ta in och mer betalt nästa gång och så skapar de en spiral. Och så finns det inget centralt system som styr det här. Så jag tror det är hela det amerikanska hälsosystem som är blivit satt på ett ordentligt pröv nu här. Att 
det er så drivet af, af finansielle interesser, som er svært at sætte sig ind i, når man er vant med at gå ned på vores centralen i Sverige, som oftest er landstingsægt. Mm. Ja, og øh, ja, amerikan og produkten af det amerikanske helsesystemet, og jeg kan øh, holde med øh, Nikolaj også, at, at øh, egentligen er det et systematisk problem i, i USA. Øh, og fremfor alt, øh, når et øh, smertpatient kommer ind, det är inte alltid garanterat att uh, rehabilitering uh, uh, betalas av försäkringsbolag. Men oftast utskrivna läkemedel uh, betalas. Så den möjligheten ibland och för ofta finns inte hos uh, amerikanska patienter att få rehabilitering. Men de får nästan alltid uh, tablett. Mm. Men givet de speciella förutsättningarna som råder då just på den amerikanska marknaden, om man, kan, om man tittar i resten av världen eh, och Europa till exempel, hur ser trenden ut där? Finns det någon motsvarande? Jag tycker inte man ska vara för självgod. Jag menar, det ser man ju över dosiffrorna i Sverige och behandlingssystemet här. Det finns ju stora problem som kommer och växer även i Sverige och Europa och inte minst Australien. Och bara ta ett land som Iran. Det finns en miljon opioidberoende personer i Iran. Och de är inte en produkt av det amerikanska systemet. Så att det här är ju en generell epidemi. Och det finns även Kinas stora tecken på att det ökar där också. Så. Mm. Ja. Den enda som man kan säga det om Europa är att hålla med Fredrik. Och bilden i Europa är mer komplicerad. Flera olika opioid innehållande produkter används i missbruk och sen blandas de oftast med ångestmediciner eller andra typer av mediciner också i missbrukssyftet så det är mer komplicerat i Europa men det finns så. Jag tror att ska man ihåg om man tittar i USA eller eller jag har läst väldigt många böcker om det här så det är på 90-talet då var det kokain som alla pratade om och kokain som flyttade in från Sydamerika. I Europa då hade vi heroin, men betydligt lägre andel heroin, kokain. Mm. Så i Europa är problemet mycket mer heroinbetingat än smärtställande. Så växer smärtställande problemet med teknik i Europa också, inte minst med en produkt som är Tramadol som kom från några år sedan. Men det är liksom, här har vi närhet till det om man producerar Valmo-blomman i mm. Afghanistan. Inte minst, och den ligger Iran ligger till exempel nära in på. Det är en annan typ av problem. Så det, medan nu så i USA när man fick kontroll på kokainproduktionen i och med att med det, kampen i, i, i Colombia gick ner så, så fick du de mexikanska grillarna som kom in och de kom fram till att man kan faktiskt producera heroin i, i Mexiko. Ja, och då började så heroin komma in den vägen. Så idag har kokainet blivit ersatt med heroin i, i USA. Mm. Så, så det är en viss del av Jag tror vi över hela världen lite efter lätta lösningar. Mm. Och man tycker att kanske samhället blir komplext. Och så är det här ett sätt att fly vardagen. Det är alltså, mm. så här stimulerande produkter som till exempel heroin. Och om man tittar på själva beroendeproblematiken, då, apropå enkla lösningar. Vad, vad är generellt det svåraste med att behandla opioidberoende? Det kan jag faktiskt säga efter att ha träffat väldigt många patienter. Det är väldigt många patienter egentligen inte vill behandlas. Mm. Alltså, det är så du har relapse rate och det, kan, så säga, det gäller oss allihop. Det finns ingen signifikant skillnad mellan eh, kamp 2038 och sublingual. Så blir det hur för att det är många patienter som står kvar i behandling efter, eh, efter när man avslutar studierna. Det, det, är en, det, det är ingen. ingen det som det är för att patienterna har, det ser ju allihop. Det sitter sedan en liten djävul som sitter på, på axeln som viskar i de dörren. Det kändes rätt bra att bli hög. Det är som det har sett att bli av med den här. Att, att då finns det liksom ett, en, ett återfall. När det blir lite jobbigt i vardagen så det är det ett lätt återfall till sitt, till sitt missbruk som man haft tidigare. Mm. Det tror jag är en stor utmaning för många patienter. Mm. Sen är det en stor utmaning. Det gäller både Europa och USA. Det är tillgången till behandling. Mm. Så I USA finns det fler delstater där du, du får behandling i kanske sex månader. Du förväntar att du är färdig behandlad. Mm. Så du vill liksom ha en automatisk systematisk att återkomma till behandlingar. Så gäller det faktiskt i Sverige också att du har en begränsad, tidsbegränsad behandling i vissa länsting. Mm. Det var faktiskt min nästa fråga. Just det, eh, om man nog väl så att säga, får in en person i behandlingen, de är beredda att ta det steget. Hur lång tid tar det generellt att, generellt att behandla ett? 
Jag tror inte att för första så tycker jag, jag håller jag inte riktigt med om att folk inte vill in i behandling. Jag tror att nästan alla opioidberoende patienter försöker att bli av med sitt missbruk. Det är liksom konsistent. Det finns några som kanske vill missbruka vid sidan om, men, men, men generellt sett så vill de bli av med sitt missbruk. Det gäller alla missbrukande personer oavsett om man håller på med snus eller eh, någonting annat. Att man vill gärna bli av med det. Så jag tror att där behöver man stöd. Och det stödet är dels genom medicinering, att man har en tillförlitlig medicinering som gör att man undviker tillfälliga relapser eller eh, återgång till beroende. Och dels naturligtvis också det andra stödet, vilket är så psykosociala stödet, inte minst viktigt för den här patientkategorin. Så att jag tror att generellt sett så missbrukare vill alltid bli av med sitt missbruk. Det finns några stycken som är underhålls missbrukar och tycker att det är kul, men, men generellt så tror jag att det står i annorlunda. Mm. Ja, din argumentation faller lite på att väldigt många kör en relapse. Alltså du, du har det är liksom för att man inte har tillräckligt bra behandling, men det är en annan ja. sak. Ja. Ja. Men, jag, tror, jag tror du gör under. Du, du gör det lite, lite för lätt. Mm. Men, men, när det gäller vår produkt, först måste patienten räddas och sen kan de behandlas. Så egentligen är det hela syftet med, med med vår produkt. Mm, mm. Eh, och om, man ser, om man nu vill behandlas, om man är inne i behandlas, vilka av dagens befintliga behandlingar anses vara mest effektiva? Alltså, vad är det ni är ute för att spöa om man säger så? I alla studier visar behandlingar med buprenorfin i vilken som helst form. Mm. Det som blev, det är I Sverige är det Socialstyrelsens mest rekommenderade läkemedel. De har första linjens behandling av buprenofin så använder de mer metadon för det är lätt att administrera. I NICE är det rekommenderat i USA som är ganska överens om det är buprenofin naloxon som är eller buprenofinprodukter som är mest effektiva. Det du konkurrerar mot är det är 90 procent som inte får behandling. Alltså, var väldigt många idag får behandling som är abstinensbaserad. Så många av behandlingscenter som man åker iväg till, det är inte minst kolla på Celebrity Rehab Sign, det är väldigt sällan man accepterar medicinsk behandling. Så jag tror det är det man behöver i USA, det är att utöka andelen av patienter som får medicinsk behandling. Nej, jag, menar, jag tror att om man tittar på behandlingseffekt och tittar på de tillgängliga medicineringarna så är det ju metadon, buprenorfin och naltrexon. Naltrexon är väldigt svårt att behandla därför att man måste vara ren innan man kan gå in i behandlingen, vilket är svårt. Buprenorfin är effektivt, men kanske metadon är lika effektivt. Problemet med metadon är att metadon är... Många gånger en farlig behandling. Vi hade en nordisk förskrivargrupp som vi pratade med igår från Danmark och, och Norge och Sverige tillsammans. Och men här kontentan för många av dem är att metadon är, det är en farlig behandling. Och vi har QT-effekter, hjärteffekter som, och det dominerar nu den europeiska behandlingslandskapet och där måste man göra någonting. Och jag tror att det kommer att bli en fråga som kommer upp mer och mer framöver. Vi har ju kanske 60-70 procent av den europeiska behandlingen är metadonbehandlad. Mm. Och vi har bara i Danmark över 150 000 överdoser i metadon. Så att det handlar mycket om, om men, och sen handlar det om hur administrerar man den behandlingen och är den förenlig med patientens liv och livsvillkor. Det. Och sen långsiktigt måste man erkänna att, att egentligen behandlar vi opioidmissbruk med opioider. Och långsiktigt skulle man egentligen önska att opioidmissbruk behandlas med icke opioidinnehållande medel. Det är inte långt ifrån science fiction men det tar några år innan vi uppnår det målet. Och om man tittar på USA där krisen är som som allra värst och har fått mest uppmärksamhet. Vad, vad gör då USAs myndigheter? Man, som sagt, man har pratat mycket om krisen när man gått ut och sagt att det här är, är landets största folkhälsoproblem och så vidare. Men vad gör man konkret för att underlätta att nya behandlingar ska komma ut på marknaden och komma patienterna till godo? Man har för lite. Man har gett, man har gett, <laughs> för lite. För lite är vad man gör. Men det är väl ett av Trumps dilemman att han har ju varit... Han gick ut med någonting men inte fullt ut. Så att, förhoppningsvis så händer någonting nu. Jag tror att det här kommer fortsätta och kanske får han, får han wall, wallen så kanske det kan bli lite bättre behandlings... Mm. 
Ja, samtidigt de är FDA är mottagliga för priority review för sådana, sådana behandlingsmetoder. Mm. Så har man ett, ett produkt som verkligen gör något mot problemet, då kan man förvänta att, att man kan argumentera åtminstone för en, en, en kortare review-period på FDA. Mm. Så det är rätt lätt att få finansiering för för projekt som gör behandling och opiatberoendes och forskningsfinansiering. Mm. Men det är ju inte det flask, alltså det, det är också en flaskhals, men det finns ju inget i pipeline i närtid som är en fundamental förändring i behandlingen. Alltså, så du har liksom det, det som idag är det största hinder det är att du saknar tillgång till, till läkare, du saknar tillgång till counselors, för det, är en, det kräver en, en multitud av interventioner. Det är inte bara medicin, det är ju väldigt mycket psychosocial support. Det hjälper personer att få tillbaka sitt liv, få tillbaka sitt jobb och vad som annars ligger runt om. Och här har du en st- det är liksom, om läkarna är ett problem så kan jag säga att counselors är ett ännu större problem. Det är en enorm flaskhals i det går inte att hitta counselors. Och då har du ett moment 22 för att få skrivet på det mitt och så småningom också Brayburns produkt när det blir godkänd. Då krävs det att man, har, att man som patient kan dokumentera att man har tillgång till en counselor, alltså någon form av psykoterapeutisk support. Men i många områden finns det ingen counselor tillgänglig. Så det är en annan flaskhals i systemet. Att nu har Donald Trump man har sagt att man skulle, Obama vill ersätta en miljard dollar för att utöka tillgången till behandling. Den har du inte riktigt blivit någonting av. Så just nu finns det ingen utökad budget, precis som Fredrik sa. Det är mycket snack med lite verkstad. Mm. Men det jag tror att det, jag menar, det, den här utvecklingen kommer att leda till förändringar i finansieringssystemet. Det finns inget annat val. Det här måste adresseras. Det är den värsta egentligen hälso kris som har varit i USA på åtminstone 80 år. Så att det, här, det här kommer att adresseras, men, men det är frågan om hur fort de medlen kommer tillgängliggöras. Mm. Sen tror jag också att man måste effektivisera vården. Och det är ett av, av våra mål att se hur kan man med nya så att säga, interventioner få en mer effektiv behandling. Mm. Det finns ju studier som har gjorts till exempel kring buprenorfinbehandling av uh, Yale till exempel. Där man har visat att social counseling har inte haft någon effekt. Så att, utan att medicinering är i princip det som har. Och det får man förhålla sig till. Men det, 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 där kommer det bli en diskussion också hur man kan effektivisera själva vården mm. och vårdsystemet. Ja. Eh, ska dels kolla hur det ligger till med tid. Eh, och det ska jag kolla vända mig till publiken och höra om det är någon som vill sticka in en fråga. Varsågod. När det gäller Europa, om nu är metadon har 60-70 procent av marknaden, varför skulle utrenorfin kunna ta någon del av den? Det är ju ofta trögt att ändra en, ett mindset. Ja, Fredrik håller på att bygga upp en kommersiell Nej, men jag, jag tror att det, är, det, är, det är helt korrekt. Den trögheten har nog varit länge. Men jag kan ju säga att när jag pratar med läkare i, i England, Tyskland, Danmark och så vidare. Så tror jag först- det har ju funnits en lojalitet i metadon. Det var ju den första behandlingen som, och det har ju säkert räddat många människor. Men insikten om nackdelarna med metadon och spridningen av metadon, dödsfall i metadon, överdoser, oförklarliga dödsfall i form av hjärteffekter och sånt där, den ökar successivt. Och naturligtvis som verksam i den här branschen så måste man ju vara med och informera om de här problemen och kanske var med i förändringsprocessen. Och vi tror att jag menar, det här är ingenting som ändras på någon dag jag på säga, eller några veckor. Men utan det är en kontinuerlig process för att skapa en bättre behandlingsform. Mm. Jag skulle ju säga, går det att vända den här trenden nu? Finns det, finns det något hopp så att säga? Och hur skulle det... Frankrike gjorde ju det 90-talet. De gjorde ju buprenorfin tillgänglig på ett väldigt enkelt sätt. Och tittar man på dödsfallen i Frankrike så reducerades de ju radikalt i samband med att buprenorfin, tabletter, subutex introducerades brett i den här franska. Så att, det är klart att det finns sätt att adressera det här. Det är bara frågan om att jobba. Jag, jag tror att det finns ett väldigt simpelt sätt, men det är, det är, inget, det är inget sätt som... Det är en biverkning också, men det finns ett väldigt simpelt sätt att ta bort den restriktion som idag finns för 
dem, som får forskrive uh, buprenofinprodukter i USA. Det er data 2000. Mm. I dag er det nogenstans er det en 6-7000 læger, som er aktive, og så er det lidt flere, som har fået det, som er blevet godkendt. Men, men det er jo en begrænsning, som, som gør, at, at det er mange, altså det er ingen vanlig primærvort central. Det var 90 procent af dem, som vi træffer, det er jo procent, det læger, som har en liten butik nogenstans. Mm. Det er bare kontors lokal, og så træffer de, sitter de og stempler ud recept. Mm. Uh, det er en af verdens bedste læger, eller man træffer det er oftest præcis den andre end den normal fordeling i bra dårlige læger. Mm. Uh, og her findes det ligesom for mange klinikker. Det, det skaber et stigma omkring patienten at søge hjælp hos en sådan læger. Uh, og jeg tror, man tager bort den her data 2000 restriktion, det er så man åbner op for alle læger og behandle, da kan det blive lettere for en læger, som sitter med en patient, som har taget smertestillende under en lang periode. Så skal vi ikke teste dig på den her produkten i stedet, for at minske risken for, at du bliver beroende. Og det kan så det er flere og flere røster i USA, som prætter om det, ikke mindst baseret på studierne i Yale, som har vist, at vi kan få en domostik tage bort den her psychosocial support kravet, og så får vi håbe, så får vi bygge op det parallelt, men just nu, så måste vi skabe en, en, en vi måste ændre i kurven. Mm. Det som er problemet er, at kostnaden, det er 2,5 milliarder dollars i bruttoomsætning i dag, det kan få 1,5 milliarder i netto, netto kostnad i ren lægemiddel, og, så kom, og det, er liksom, det er bare en 5-6 procent af totale kostnadsbørden i, med, læke, i medicindelen. Mm. Bare fjerne den her, da kommer, ser du en, en eksplosion i kostnad, og det tror jeg tyvärr hur cyniskt den måste vara. Det är ett problem i USA. Nu sitter man här två veckor kvar innan man har ett nytt budget shutdown. Mm. Och det är liksom, hur hittar man de resurser i systemet till att kunna behandla fler patienter? Mm. Det tror jag är ett, ett jättestort hinder. Om man pratar många av dem så kan det ju liksom på... De, de är helt överens om vad det som ska till. Men dagen efter så går du ut och fattar ett beslut som är mer pengadrivet eller budgetdrivet än det är egentligen drivet av att patienten måste tillgång till behandling. Mm. Ja, det är en enkel ekvation egentligen. Är det, är det ta ner ingång av patienterna som blir beroendet och sen egentligen utgår ifrån att beroendet är ett, ett biverkning som ska behandlas. Och under behandling ska man ha tillgång till antidoten och efter behandling måste man utgå ifrån att i ett antal patienter beroendet utvecklas och den ska byggas in i hela vårdsystemet, mm. hela kedjan. Lite mer noggrant utval av patienterna som verkligen ska ha behandlingen. Och sen väldigt försiktigt med behandlingsförloppet. Mm. Och, 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 och om man då lyckas, och så att man lyckas få ner, trycka ner eh, beroende problematiken, man, man vänder trenden. Då minskar ju även efterfrågan på eh, till exempel era produkter. Hur, hur ser ni på den paradoxen? Det är en fantastisk värld i så fall om man har gjort den. Mm. Eller som det, det, är en, det är lite en hypotetisk fråga, för du sitter idag med 10-20 miljoner amerikaner som beroende så går det till Kina, Ryssland, och, eh, Iran och Europa. Mm. Uh, om det är så att, att vi under en period får möjlighet för att ta en, en andel av 10-20 miljoner amerikaners behandling för att bli av med sitt beroende så skulle inte jag vara glad än, än någon annan. Och så kan jag säga att om ja, ett antal år så är de pengar vi får in där så förhoppningsvis så vi kan bygga på en ny pipeline och andra produkter. Mm. Så, så ja, så det jobbar vi för. Det är som vårt målsättning just nu det är att för, också försöka prata med folk om behovet av att minska dosen. Idag så pratar de väldigt mycket dose to effect. Mm. Men på vilket sätt kan man hitta sätt att minska dosen stegvis? Vilket oftast är små steg och så kan man behöva ha jag lite grann små steg neråt. Att skapa den flexibilitet som har en långsiktighet i behandlingen. Men jag ska också, om, det, om det är någon hitta en lösning, då ska vi vara väldigt intresserade av att bli en del av det projekt tillsammans med andra bolag ska gissa, men det ska vara fantastiskt. Ja. Jag kan bara hålla med. Vårt jobb är att lösa problem. Det här är ett samhällsproblem, det är hälsoproblem. Men det finns inget ont om problem i hälsovårdssystemet. Så det är bara att ta nästa problem. Mm. Jag tror att man kan göra jämförelse med med epidemier och allting. Jag menar, det, de kanske går åt rätt håll, men det tar lång tid och den tiden. Jag menar, vi vill vara med delaktiga i den process som vi vill åstadkomma resultat. Men eh, alla positiva resultat kommer att driva fortsatt medicinering och det är också en viktig del av det. Det här är ingen sjukdom som man blir av med på två veckor, utan ofta är det ju så att det är underhållsbehandling som är det effektivaste sättet. 
det kanske i ordet cynism kanske man använder det men jag tror att det absolut viktigaste är att vi tar hand om de här människorna de, så att de får ett värdigt liv och det är vår mission. Mm. Det börjar bli dags att runda av. Jag tänkte att jag skulle avsluta med att be er alla tre om man tittar på 2018 vilken är den enskilt mest intressanta och viktiga milstolpe trigger som ni väntar på under 2018. Om vi börjar med dig Scott. Ja, i kommer in i kliniska studier med vår, vår projekt eh, framförallt de två ledande projekt att vi ska sparka igång de kliniska studierna. Mm. Ja, jag, skulle, jag, jag gillar inte det här en negativ men det är också att vi har haft en patient rätta gång hängande över oss under väldigt lång tid och resultatet börjar komma nu här under. 2018 och den försvinner så ser vi att vi har alla möjligheter för att växa marknaden i USA. Så det, det är väl vårt viktigaste trick att tyvärr, men det är en negativ trick. Mm. Men um, det ser bra ut än så länge. Mm. Okay. Ja, det är ju uppenbart. Det. Godkännande och lanseringar i Europa, USA och Australien. Mm. Vi ser allihopa fram emot att de här milstolparna uppfylls. Stort tack för att ni kom hit idag och stort tack för att ni kom hit idag. Och stort tack till alla som har tittat där ute. Vi återkommer med fler event framöver. Tack så mycket. Tack så mycket.